Hey everybody, and welcome to a very lively episode of the Babylon Bee Interview Show. Right. Today we're talking to Jonah Goldberg. Yeah, Jonah Goldberg. Now, I don't know uh, who knows who Jonah Goldberg is and who doesn't. Uh, he's big on Twitter. He's an author. I found him through, I, uh, I think when I first got into politics, he wrote a book called Liberal Fascism, which was uh, pretty... I mean, you know, it, it was nobody would really kind of like call out the left the way he did on a lot of the things that that they do that align uh, with fascism because the right was always being called that. And I saw him on The Daily Show and he'll, he'll talk about that in, in this interview. But one thing I like about Jonah is he's a like he said that he almost became a humorist, but he kind of like dialed back and he's a political writer, but he's very funny and witty and smart. He owns us a lot. In this interview, it makes us look really dumb, which we are. But but most yeah, people the are most condescending <laughs> we've experienced. Most people are polite. A fun, a fun type of condescending. Most people are polite enough not to point it out. Yeah, <laughs> that we're not very smart. Yeah, he disliked. But he was not. He pounded on. And then there's some great stuff in the subscriber portion on this one. Yeah. So Jonah Goldberg, I knew of him from the National Review. I think you wrote there for many years, mm-hmm. um, and I think you recently left and di- uh, founded the Dispatch, right? It's kind of conservative uh, ish publication, and he, right? And he's known for being, which the National Review is kind of known for being, also, I think, uh, a lot of never Trump type people there, a lot of uh, very critical, at least of Trump. He's never adopted the, the uh, we'll, we'll talk to him about it, but uh, so that's one area that he's, you know, you mentioned the name Jonah Goldberg to certain groups of people in conservatism, and they start to just like spout pea soup prediction right now the comment section under the video yeah they are spouting pea there's soup. angry <laughs> people whose heads are spinning around <laughs> and they're crab walking around the walls <laughs> Jonah Goldberg, ah! yeah. but it was a very fun conversation so here we go so jonah what's going on man got any cool stories for us it's yeah. great to be here we're skyping cool. with jonah goldberg yeah i uh yeah. And writer of liberal fascism, uh, which means you're a hardcore right winger, but also a never Trumper, which means that you're just a bootlicking leftist lover. Is As Walt Whitman term? said, I can if I contradict myself, that's okay. I contain multitudes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so never Trumper. Do you? I mean, do you adopt this label? Do you have a never never Trump tattoo on yourself somewhere? A never Trump stamp. Never Trump stamp on your lower back. I actually, so it's, I, I do not use the, have not used the term never Trump, which for me was always just sort of a hashtag shorthand bumper sticker thing for Twitter and whatnot to say I wasn't going to endorse the guy and I wasn't going to vote for him, which is true. And since then, it's become this thing. But I actually wrote a piece right after he won um, saying never Trump, never more, just on the grounds that you only have one president at a time, and I don't know what never Trump is supposed to mean once the guy is actually president of the United States. Um, you know, there's this thing on the left where they can't accept the fact that he was actually elected. And I'm like, well, then who, who, who's president if, 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 it's not, if he wasn't elected? You know, I mean, like he's, the, the Marines salute him when he gets on the helicopter. Um, seems like he's president. But I still, I'm not going to vote for him. Um, I don't think he's a person of good character. I think he has had some real successes, but as my friend Kevin Williamson puts it, most of his successes have to do with the areas where he has no interest in how to govern and so lets the establishment get things done, like appointing good judges and that kind of stuff. And the places where he actually pays attention, he tends to muck things up. So this is getting released on election day, yeah, I this, believe. Yeah, this is like on election so day. So right now, the, they are probably talking about result poll results and the maps are coming out and What's your prediction? Who's winning right now when this is released? I hope that for the, the, the very strange, sweaty, weird person who waited till election day to decide who to vote for, that I haven't suppressed that person. <laughs> uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if, you know, this is one of my great peeves about elections, and I've written about this for 20 years. Um, because of the nature of how a two-party system works and yada, 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 we can get into political science. Every election is basically decided at the end of the day. The most crucial voters at the end are the undecided voters who tend to be either literally or figuratively morons. Um, Because if you can watch an election for like 18 months and not figure out 
who you're for and think like every every four years we have a presidential debate and you, the CNN or someone will go to these focus groups and they'll ask them all of undecideds and they'll be like, no. what do you think? So, well, I, I really wanted to hear more about education. It's like, really? It's like late October and you, <laughs> your vote was hinging on who gave a wonkier answer on on education when you could have looked up their positions as if their positions mattered on their website for like a year. Um, so anyway, I just, again, I don't want to discourage that one person who has an epiphany and decides that who they want to vote for. Uh, my prediction is Trump loses. Uh, I am not, I shouldn't say my prediction. Uh, it's, uh, it's more of a prophecy in the sense that, uh, and not because my name is Jonah, uh, but because <laughs> prophecies biblically understood are, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you, your language here, guys, um, are not predictions, they're warnings. And um, if you do the right things, you can prevent the thing that's being warned about from happening, you know, like Nineveh and all that stuff that my namesake did. So uh, I think if you had to bet right now, it really looks like Donald Trump is going to lose. Um, but it's not impossible for him to win. It's just it's becoming more and more like a five game parlay than a straight up easy thing for him to do. Gotcha. So if it comes down to one vote decided the election and it was you and you didn't vote, we can blame you. Country I think Washington, D.C., which should run for Biden by about 92 percent. So my vote uh, literally doesn't matter. And that's one of the reasons why I feel perfectly free not to vote for him. Well, we're in California, so yeah, we, we were in the same situation here. <laughs> I, I know I, I feel bad because I tell people I don't vote, but it's not this big moral <laughs> stand because I'm like it's easy for me. I live in California, my vote doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> for president anyway. I've never lived anywhere my vote wasn't eight to one. So yeah, um, this, voting has always been a statement of of vanity or yeah. minor mm -hmm. issues, you know, you know, down ballot type stuff. I mean. I don't, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. We were like Christians in ancient Rome because we were conservatives. And um, and the only other places I've lived have been Baltimore, Prague, and Washington, D.C. So, like, my vote is meaningless. So what, you, if, what if you were a father on, de on your deathbed and your daughter was harassing you to, to vote against, to vote as a uh, d Democrat? What would you, did you do? see that that girl on Twitter? Uh, uh, TikTok or I, talk oh or? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I did see that. Um, uh, uh, I think I would tell my daughter, "You really don't want to have this as your last memory of your wonderful dad." So maybe you want to walk out of the room, throw some cold water on your face, and bring me a drawing of something. Uh, because, uh, but no, I. I, I, I I don't know who I would, you know, like, let, let's, let's hope I'm not in that situation to have to figure it out. Figure it, out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dumb question. We yeah. ask a lot of those on this. No show. dumb questions. They're only dumb answers. Dumb people. There's some dumb questions. Yeah, it's true. On this show. We, we aim for them. So speaking of dumb questions, uh, would you vote for Trump if he provided a loving home to every orphan basset hound in the nation? I would get much closer to saying yes, but, okay. uh, embedded in the, the, the premise of the question, which is why it makes it dumb, is contrary to what I said moments ago. <laughs> you said there was no dumb There's questions. There's no such thing as a widespread orphan basset hound problem because basset hounds, basset hound puppies are scientifically proven to be irresistible and no one would let a basset hound puppy suffer or be alone on the street for more than a nanosecond before they took it in. But once they get big, I mean, they take the worst smelling dumps. They're big and slow. Uh, they're stepping on their ears. Then do people get rid of bass hounds once they're big? I'm sure some do. I, I, I am a former. I'm a I'm, 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 I'm part of the uh, international order of current or former bass and hound owners. And um, I think the, the basset is the noblest of beasts. Um, I do not recommend it as a dog for everybody. <laughs> Uh, because, I mean, let's face it. I mean, they were they were basically built like. Imagine you have a factory, like a garment factory, where they make dogs, and mm -hmm. they had a lot of extra skin, but just had bad logistical inventory management and not enough leg, and so they're just really weirdly constructed, as if they're made from excess scraps of some stuff and a shortage of other things, and mm -hmm. they are the most stubborn of beasts. But I love basset hounds. Mm. 
Am I doing this right? I mean, I don't know. This is your podcast. I mean, you're good. good. We're we're just going to give you a few things. We're going to see if you would, how, how never Trump are you? So, so that, I thought that was the we're one. We're trying that to convert you. you into a sometime. What about Trump? if he like what fought Bass and Hound cancer? That's all right. We'll get off Bass and Hounds. Yeah. <laughs> I'm steadfastly against Bass and Hound cancer, but again, I think fighting Bass and Hound cancer is a bipartisan <laughs> issue already and doesn't need Donald yeah. Trump. Um uh but yes, I let, let let me skip ahead before you run through all of my favorite animals. Um <laughs> I am sure you could construct some scenario in which the alternative is I have to watch Jeffrey Tubin on a Zoom call for the rest of my life or vote for Donald Trump. I will vote for Donald Trump. Okay? I mean, there are things you can conceive of. That can be arranged. Cause me to do it. Uh, but short of these outlandish scenarios, these weird Kobayashi Marus that you're trying to come up with, uh, I am not planning on voting for Donald Trump. Under any circumstance. That was the content was like of our show, whole, dude. Yeah. Like, that was... <laughs> that was it. That's all we had. So, I, I guess, do you have any cool stories you want to tell us? Or, I, um, You've been on The Daily Show. Have you ever got any yeah. stories from being on The Daily Show? Do you ever get harassed by... Like, you're, uh, you ever get wedgied by liberals or anything? Yeah, so yeah. I, I was on in the 2004 cycle. Um, and it went really, really, really well. I, I, I've been on three times. Two times. So it was okay. on the 2004 the two cycle. And it went really well. It was with, um, what's his name? The old uh, Stewart, John Stewart. John Stewart. And, and uh, good times were had by all. Uh, nothing yeah. really remarkable to talk about. I, I remember unfurling my extended Johnny Bravo theory about Wesley Clark. Um, I guess I have to explain some of this to you people since you were fetuses at the time. Um <laughs> Uh, Johnny Bravo was the rock star that um, Greg Brady played in the Brady Bunch, and it turned out that they didn't. The, the record label didn't think he was talented at all. He just fit the suit that they wanted him to wear, and that was my view about Wesley Clark running, who was a former NATO commander. Is that they just the Democrats wanted to have a military guy run, and so they used the Johnny Bravo candidate. Anyway, that went well because John Stewart's about my age, and we grew up watching things like the Brady Bunch. Like, the next time I went on was for liberal fascism. That I saw went less well. Yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> uh, he didn't like that book title, I don't think. Uh, there was like the Inquisition. There was the Red Scare. And there was my appearance on the, uh, for uh, Daily Show. And basically, um, he thought that he could go into an interview with me after I'd spent like five years like reading up on fascism. And he thought with an afternoon of Googling, he could like yeah. own me fascism. Mm-hmm. And uh, he couldn't. Um, and at the same time, I had this naive idea that I would walk into the studio of The Daily Show and actually have a conversation about what I'd written and it would be go as swimmingly as my previous appearance. And instead, we ended up hurling F-bombs at each other. Um, and I don't mean the word fascist uh, quite a bit. And um, like normally that segment it was like supposed to be four to six minutes. And they rolled tape for like 28 minutes and oh, man. then turned off the cameras. And then we yell at each other for another 10 minutes after. And the only thing I'll say in, in Stewart's defense is that when they finally aired the portion of the interview that they wanted to air, uh, they made no pretense at pretending that it was like a natural conversation. They were just like, this was a mess. Here are a bunch of clips from it. And um, that ended up helping me because it, it, they at least didn't make it look like – they didn't try to edit it to make me look like a fool, though, of course, the left thought I looked foolish. Mm-hmm. They just tried to stitch together this sort of Frankenstein's monster yeah. of a really ha- bad conversation that went really bad. Yeah, I remember seeing it and thinking, uh, yeah, it did feel really disjointed. And you could tell Stuart was really trying to, like, own you in front of his audience. Like, because he, 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 he had the audience, you know, it's kind of like Bill Maher's show. They're, they're there to cheer for whatever he says, it feels like, in those situations when they have someone from the other side on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think an important difference between Bill Maher and, and John Stewart is that John Stewart is actually talented and funny. And um, 
Bill Maher is like, you know, I think he has hooves. Um, I am not a, 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 a big fan of Bill Maher. It's the one show I've, uh, I've told my publicist I will never go on again. Um, not a big fan of Bill Maher. So. What about Babylon Bee Podcast? Would you come back on the Babylon Bee Podcast? I think you have to ask me at the end of the Babylon Bee Podcast. As, as it's going right now, I just feel like I should be hosting the Babylon Bee Podcast. But, uh, but so far, it's, 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 it's a lovely experience. I mean, I really appreciate the booze you sent ahead. Yeah, uh, we do what we can. Even though I wasn't planning on this being video, I wasn't thinking this morning because you know, I was drunk. Um, I did for Ethan's sake wear my bear t-shirt with a bear being hugged on it um are asking for a hug just because you know i want to bait you guys <laughs> can you leave the camera like that the rest of the time just <laughs> that's what got tubin in trouble <laughs> no, I we just want to remind you you're on video so i don't want to pull a tube in here so so from your like liberal fascism uh five years of digging into that how do you see all this Antifa craziness? What's your, uh, is this, does this fit into that? Was this, did you prophesy this stuff? Uh, you know, I, I got a lot of stuff right. And I got a lot of stuff. I, I don't, I honestly don't think I got a lot of stuff wrong in liberal fascism. I, I, I didn't anticipate some stuff that has happened on the right since I wrote it. And one of these days I'll write about that. But, um, yeah, look, I mean the, the Antifa stuff that is, um, I mean, I, I love these morons who say they can't be fascist because they say they're anti-fascist, <laughs> which like you have to be too stupid to be a spell checker in an M&M &M factory to, to think that that's like a great argument. I mean, it's like saying, you know, North Korea can't be undemocratic. It's got democracy and democratic in the title. I mean, like it's just so friggin' dumb. And and I love the blue checkmark crowd that that throws that around as if it's this uh, super clever retort. It's like when they show, show pictures from like D-Day. It's like the original anti-fascists, which is just an unbelievable slander to you know American troops, whatnot. But. Look, the one of the core things about original fascism, which is actually kind of different from Nazism, mm -hmm. is just this glorification of street violence, the glorification mm -hmm. of, of brute force in the streets, taking back the streets, owning the streets. Um, if you look at what the original fascisti were, it was a lot of that stuff. The black chair, black shirts were all about like sort of owning the streets. The original fights in in, in Germany between the brown shirts and the red shirts were all about who gets to own the streets. And, uh, and that kind of just sort of physical intimidation and, and sort of gang thuggery stuff is perfectly consistent with, with, with fascism. And one way you can tell is that if they had been members of the NRA, everybody would say, well, obviously they're fascists, right? I mean, if they'd been right wingers, they'd be fascist. seems I'm, I'm sort of of the school that says, First of all, that we shouldn't be talking a lot about fascism anymore, but that's a different conversation. But if you're going to identify fascistic behavior and define it as sort of goonish street mob violence, but only if it's done for my side of a political argument and not the other side, I mean, or the other, you know, or the other way around, then it's just sort of a meaningless term that people use. I mean, it's it's. You know, Orwell said in politics in the English language, fascism has just simply come to mean anything not desirable. And I think that's the way 90 percent of the people who use it, um, they're blind to the sins of their own side and they see stuff that looks fascistic to them on the other side and say, see how terrible it is. That makes them fascist while condoning the crap that happens on their own side. Hmm. How fascist is Trump? Well, that's part of the thing I got wrong and um, or I, I didn't anticipate in liberal fascism. Um, I think Trump is naturally inclined to sort of strongman thinking, to authoritarian thinking. Um, I think he, like a lot of authoritarian types, uh, defines right and wrong basically as personal loyalty to him, which is a very authoritarian way of doing things. He uh, he actually likes. He, he, he doesn't mind street violence. He just likes it when it's on his side of things. The, the real issue isn't his sort of authoritarian personality or his tendencies or any of that kind of stuff. 
the thing that keeps him from being an effective strongman or authoritarianism is his profound basset hound like laziness. <laughs> uh, the guy just, I mean, like real strongmen, real authoritarians, it takes a lot of work, right? You got to figure out how to put, you know, this union leader's, you know, take the favorite horse of this union leader and put it in his bed. You know, you got to figure out how to, whose car to blow up. You got to figure out who to bribe. <laughs> Which military officers need to be purged and thrown on thrown in jail for trumped up charges? That's what real authoritarian strongmen do. He doesn't want that. He's never wanted to actually use the power or even familiarize himself with the powers of the job. He just likes the adulation that a Hugo Chavez or Fidel Castro gets, but he doesn't want to do any of the work to actually solidify that kind of power. And you know, this is something a lot of people on the left miss: is that. He, he doesn't play four dimensional chess or 10 moves ahead. He is literally addicted to the news cycle of Twitter and he spends his days, you know, with his narcissistic ego running around like an escaped monkey from a cocaine study and um, really doesn't have any sort of strategic sense about how to orchestrate the consolidation of power or any of that kind of stuff. And that's good news for America. Um, and if the alternative is, I mean, if he had Pat Buchanan's brain in there or, or you know, uh, you know, even Mussolini's brain in there and still had his charisma, he could do real damage to America. But I, I think literally he's just too lazy and too intellectually incurious to do anything that doesn't come easily to him, which is one of the reasons why he likes other people to do the heavy lifting of bad things for him, because he just doesn't want the accountability of being responsible for it, you know? Right. So it's like whether it's a story or whether it's like telling the crowds to rough up people, uh, he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't even like to fire people. The guy made his name, you know, as a reality show star firing people. And I don't think a single one of these people that he has fired from his administration actually was fired face to face because he likes controversy, but he hates personal confrontation, which is not what a, like an effective strongman, you know, that's not what, how effective strongmen work. So today he gets voted out of office. Does he lock himself in there and not ever leave? I think he leaves. I mean, look, I mean, does he put up a stink if uh, it's really close and you're waiting for absentee ballots to come in? Maybe. Um, but I think a lot of this is just show. And uh, the one thing I can guarantee you is, is that there are very few people outside. I mean, look, will Stephen Miller be like one of those kids in that movie Taps, Taps. You know, remember that movie with uh, the military school kids who take over the military school? I could see someone like Probably Stephen Miller barricading <laughs> the door and, you know, um, and agreeing to fight to the death to keep to stay in there. But for the most part, no one is going to follow a lot of crazy orders from this guy. I don't think he would give them. He wants to go back to Mar-a-Lago, which will be like his Napoleonic Elba. And um, maybe he'll start a TV series, I mean, a TV network by, you know, you know, uh, you know, OANN. Um, and, and maybe he'll call it, you know, OANN, the libs, you know, own the libs or something. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I do not see him going, you know, like a, there's not going to be a downfall video of him refusing to leave power. <laughs> Sad. Yeah. Um. Ethan really liked your book, Tyranny of Clichés. I haven't read it. Well, I, yeah. To clarify, I, I, I think I like liberal fascism better, but I love one of my... I just love the first chapter of when you kind of just sum up the book. I wasn't as into the minutia, but I loved the first chapter to me. is just like, I recommend it to people all the time. Uh, well, thank you. And you don't have to feel bad about not reading it. The important thing is buying it. Yeah, yeah I bought it. So, <laughs> yeah, I got that done. Um, yeah, we should go through some of those cliches. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to see if we could hit some of the cliches. What here. are some of the, that you would add from now? Because you, you, oh, it's been a, good, a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it has been a while. I mean, um, I don't know. I, I, I got to think about that a little bit. Uh, only one other person has ever asked me that question, and it kind of took me off guard. Um, oh, been, you had one before, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I guess one would be... Um, I mean, so look, I mean, just so you guys know and your listeners know where I'm coming from, I'm still very much conservative. I haven't gone full Jen Rubin. I haven't decided that 
because okay. Donald Trump says two plus two is four, therefore it must be a duck. Um, <laughs> you know, I haven't lost my mind about all that kind of stuff. There are lots of things that Trump has done that I approve of, or there are a lot, and there are even more things that Trump is that have happened on Trump's watch that I approve of. Um, but uh, I'm kind of done with a lot of the. I paid my dues. I've drunk more liberal tears than could last most people a lifetime. I've done my own the lib shtick. I'm kind of done with it. And so like one of the things I would, very little of the substance of tyranny cliches that I would change or of liberal fascism, I would add some things to it because I think one of the things that being on the, you know, on the outs of Trump world for the last four years is it frees me up to see the, the shortcomings in my own side a little bit, which is sort of, you know, some of the stuff that you guys do as well. And, um, and so if I were going to redo tyranny cliches today, I probably would get rid of the subtitle. Oh, I get rid of the title too, because the title, but it, this is a technical term from the publishing industry. It sucks. Donkey. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I cannot begin to tell you how, um, like I would say 20% of right wing talk radio hosts don't know how to pronounce the word cliche. <laughs> and so like it's a, it's a very awkward moment, kind of need a German word for it when someone says, and up next we got Jonah Goldberg, author of the tyranny of the clitches. Like, do I correct them? Do I do let go? But anyway, um, the whole book, the title, the top part of the title, I mean, I, I might keep the word, the words the and of and fill in the rest, but the problem is that it's it sounds like a hyped up steroidal style guide. And the problem with the subtitle is, yeah, I still think liberals cheat a lot in the war of ideas. And I think in many ways they cheat more than conservatives do. But there's a lot of cheating going on among conservatives, too. And so if I was going to add some today, you know, one I might add is this whole disruptor thing. You know, like uh, every time Donald Trump. Um, Mike Pence goes out there and salutes his broad shouldered leadership and talks about how, you know, he was voted, he was elected to be a disruptor as if, first of all, that's entirely true, which is not entirely true, but it's partly true. Um, but second of all, there are different kinds of disruption. It's sort of like people who take pride in calling themselves a contrarian. And, you know, my long established position is if you are a contrarian solely for contrarianism's sake, Absent any other context, you are what people call a hacksaw. <laughs> um, Another one of those technical terms. Yeah. If you're having a meeting and you're saying, oh, my God, you know, uh, uh, we got a huge problem. This meteor is coming to Earth. We've got it locked on radar. We got maybe 48 hours to save the planet. And your immediate response is, well, I think we should really sleep on this, yes. right? You know, you just, if you automatically take a contrarian point of view, regardless of what the facts are, you're just a pain in the donkey. Ass. And um, it's similar with this disruption stuff. I don't mind good disruption, but it all is contextual. It depends what you're disrupting and why. And, you know, Donald Trump could take a giant deuce on the Lincoln Memorial and Mike Pence will go out there and say, well, you know, he was elected to be a disruptor. Um, that's not what I'm looking for. And it's, it's not an excuse for things, particularly when people like Pence, um, the second the other side violates norms or does something disruptive, all of a sudden he's saddened and disappointed that the Democrats would so violate norms and traditions and yada, yada, yada. Um, you can't weaponize norms um, for the other side and exempt yourself from them for your side simply by saying like Shazam, he's a disruptor. But anyway, I'd have to think about it more for other things that would go. Would go. And you almost left him speechless there for a second, almost. Ethan. And then hard hitting, going, uh, yeah. hard hitting interviewer. Um, and yeah, tyranny of cliche, tyranny of clitches. You said, uh, <laughs> violence never solves anything was one of your clitches. <laughs> it's not true. Violence okay. solves a lot of things, particularly in these situations called violent mm -hmm. situations. And, um, you know, if you saw someone getting, let's say you saw uh, someone getting uh, mugged or raped or brutalized by a, by a gang, like you, you, you're a cop, right? You take out your gun and you're going to run over to sort of break it up and save the person. And then you look at your gun 
and you're like, and you're like oh, crap, and throw it away because obviously guns useless because violence can't solve anything, right? I mean, violence is really useful to solve problems that require violence, um, like, I don't the Holocaust or slavery or, like, um, uh, winning wars. I mean, like, these things, sometimes violence is actually required. And the problem that you get with with violence never solved anything is that it's usually part of this sort of Gandhian BS where they try to sneak in like a Trojan horse, these peacenik ideas, sort of like I was saying about what, when Mike Pence weaponizes ideas, um, people, you know, say, you know, give peace a chance. They never say give peace a chance to like Saddam Hussein or the Nazis or to Kim Jong-il. It's always give peace a chance to Western democratic governments, as if like it's their fault for pursuing violence and the violent people are bad. And the best example of this, as I wrote about in there, is Gandhi himself. Gandhi look, has a lot of things going for him. He's a complicated historical figure. But, you know, his advice to the Jews of Germany was to commit mass suicide. Um, and his advice to the people of England in the face of Nazi aggression was mass surrender. He said, lay down your weapons, give up your island but, you know, uphold this notion of, you know, your principles or whatever. Now, first of all, as a guy named Goldberg, you might think that telling the Jews to all kill themselves is not my, my idea of the most efficacious public policy proposal. But um, <laughs> he never said to Adolf Hitler, who he wrote letters to and called him his friend, you know, hey, you know, maybe you don't want to invade Poland, you know, because violence doesn't solve anything. It's this kind of argument that people, this peacenicky kind of argument that people only use on Westerners because they feel like they can uh, arouse their conscience. And if you just work from the assumption that the other side isn't prone to these kinds of arguments, they never make it. And so it's, it's basically a lack of confidence in the West that usually invokes this kind of stuff and they never use it on the actual guilty parties in violent situations. Sounds like he's pro-riot, pro-violence. That's what I'm hearing. Is that what, yeah, Jonah Goldberg is yeah, pro Jonah. Jonah Goldberg comes up. He joined BLM. That's what's happened. He's anti-Trump. Now he's a BLMer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were always looking for an angle. <laughs> is there any, um, like, what is it? I mean, I, I, if I had all the smart stuff in my brain, uh, I would <laughs> love I had to be able to things in my outline head. to my daughter. Brevagen. Brevagen. <laughs> Have you seen these ads? Yeah. It's, it, it, with a key ingredient that comes from jellyfish. Okay. And they always say that as if, like, <laughs> My immediate response is that jellyfish are super smart when, in fact, they don't even have freaking brains to begin with. But anyway, go on. And do the work running along the beach, sucking on jellyfish. You just get it in a capsule. Okay. Um, so my daughter's uh, 13. She just turned 14. Uh, very uh, swept up in Black Lives Matter and all this stuff. She's always coming home with all the things she learned on Instagram. I always wish I had, like, the big brainy way of saying, like, this kind of language is useful to get people to get into a very angry group and all one idea. How what would you say to your daughter if she came home with it? Put some smart stuff in. Yeah, can, you put some, can you be my jellyfish? <laughs> can you be my, be my jellyfish <laughs> capsule? <laughs> my daughter's 17 and she's getting a lot of this stuff too. And, you know, yeah. she get she shows me these Instagram things that make me want to cut myself. Um, yes. <laughs> mostly about cap capitalism stuff and whatnot. But, um, um, you know, it, de it look, it depends on what what they're actually bringing home. I mean, if 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 your 14 year old daughter is picking is showing you her phone and it just says kill Whitey, um, <laughs> I would like to think that you don't need some really highfalutin intellectual argument for me about why that's kind of <laughs> unsuitable. Um, but like, you know, the. The the basic the, the good version of Black Lives Matter stuff I can't get wildly worked up about. It's just that it gets swamped by all the bad stuff, and um, my basic view on identity politics. I write about this in my my most recent and most uh, mm -hmm. optimistically titled book, uh, Suicide of the West. Um, <laughs> which I'm so glad the publisher talked me out of. Take a bath with a toaster. Um, <laughs> is uh, 
The problem with identity politics is that they are, in many respects, um, making the problem that, that they're, they're aiming to fix worse. Right. If you work, you, you work on. I mean, this is a very Tom Soul point. You know, you know. If you think that um, all you need to know about someone to make a judgment about their character mm-hmm. or their worth or their value is the color of their skin, then you're racist. You know. Um, and if if racist is too politically radioactive a term these days to be used accurately, fine. You're bigoted. Um, and. The problem with identity politics is that it's actually an incredibly old way of thinking. It is um, the oldest form of identity politics was actually aristocracy, which was this idea that first, you know, aristocracy literally means from the Greek the rule of the best, but it quickly meant came to mean rule of the most noble, right? People with the best blood. And it was this idea that nobility was inheritable. And that if you were simply if you were a prince, then your kid will be a prince and then so on forever. And borrowing some from some bad use of of I think it's Aristotle. They started to say that some people are just born slaves by nature. And um, that sort of thinking is identity politics. It says that simply by the virtues of the circumstances of your birth, which you have no control over whatsoever, which is why I hate youth politics, you know, people you know, bragging about how the fact that nine months before they were born, their parents got together as if like that's some huge accomplishment on their part. Um, but uh, uh, if you walk, if, 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 if you have this assumption that simple, that some people are simply better than other people or more deserving of sympathy or empathy or anger or rage or punishment or any of these things, simply by virtue of the circumstances of their birth or the color of their skin um, or who their parents were. That's not modern and hip and, and clever and progressive. That is some ancient turn up right there. That is like old school tribal nonsense. And part of my big epiphany over the last 20 years is that there are very few new ideas out there. And one of the only great, really good new ideas of the last, you know, let's call it a couple thousand years um, is liberal democratic capitalism, which was a radical new idea in the history of humanity. All of this identity politics stuff, all of this socialism stuff, all this fascism stuff, all this communism stuff, these are old, old, old ideas that ping the sweet tooths of our brain because they seem more natural because tribalism is more natural than democracy and freedom. Um, And so we keep coming up, having to have these same arguments over and over again, where people come up with all sorts of clever new names and arguments for the same old junk. And that's my view about a lot of the BLM stuff, a lot of the, the, the nationalism stuff. It all falls under you know, one form of tribalism or another. Or another. Mm. I'll tell her that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I don't, what, what is she coming home and asking you? I mean, like, what does BLM stand yeah, for? Tell her the Bureau of Land Management and you're for it. There's no asking or uh, discussion. It's like, this is true. I read this on Instagram. If you don't agree with this, you are fascist. So... She, like she just found out her uh, her grandmother went to a Trump rally and she is like so now she wants to disown her you know it's like that hard like she just learned if you if you say or believe this you are evil yeah well, you should disabuse her of that right I mean like like the whole idea that politics of any kind right um I shouldn't say of any kind I mean if you're like if you're straight up Himmler or something like that, okay, I'm going to judge you. But like <laughs> within the 40 yard lines of American politics, the idea that you can tell everything that you need to know about somebody because who, the, who they vote for or that you have a window into their soul, I think is a real problem. And it's a problem that infects both sides. But I think the left has been practicing it for far longer. And I, I you know, look mm-hmm. again, last name Goldberg. I'm more of an Old Testament kind of guy. But it also strikes me as profoundly unchristian to think in those terms. And um, and one of the reasons I've always called myself a conservative and one of the reasons I like conservatism is that I believe that conservatism properly understood is only a partial philosophy of life. Mm-hmm. You know, and the political realm, it doesn't tell you what clothes to eat or what food to drink or, or the other way around or vice versa, because I'm just rambling now. Um, <laughs> what is it Willy Wonka says? Scratch that, reverse it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it. You know, it just tells you who you think you should vote for um, and what policies you should prefer compared to other politicians and other policies. 
Yeah. Yes. I Sometimes I see that kind of thinking is very like, it's very uh, myopic in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't see the scope of human history that we've gone of, of, of everything that we fought against to get where we right. are. You know, it's a Chestertonian idea. G.K. Chesterton. That, that we climb the ladder and then kick the ladder that we climbed mm -hmm. up on. You know, <laughs> we, has, <laughs> we, we, we declare war on these ideas that got us to where we are. I mean, I, I do think it leads us to this place of gratitude that, you know, life really does have a lot of suffering in it. And, and <laughs> the whole, hu hu whole, you know, hu human history is, is a very dark thing um, a lot of the times. And to actually have some goodness, you know, and some light now, it's like, yeah, it, it, it makes here. me extremely grateful. I, I don't know if you touch on that in, um, in Suicide of the West, which, you know, the, the very optimistically titled book, but. <laughs> I do. In fact, the whole book ends with a note about gratitude. And I'm, I'm, look, I, if every time I wrote about Chesterton's fence, I got a dollar. <laughs> I'd, I'd be able to buy a pretty nice meal. And um, uh, I'm very much a Chesitonian when it comes to dogma. I want more dogma, not less. I think we are that human civilization progresses when we we put to bed certain questions. And when people say, um, you know, oh, don't be dogmatic. I'm mean, like, OK, so you're not dogmatically opposed to murder. You're not dogmatically opposed to pedophilia. You're not dogmatically opposed to torturing basset hound puppies. You know, I mean, these are questions that do not get to re be revisited because they've been settled. And a society that thinks that every question, that all questions are valid, that all issues need to be revisited, is um, a society that, that wants to consider barbarism to still be a live option. And I don't want barbarism to be a live option. And the big theme of the book is that we should be grateful and that we should understand that for 250,000 years since we split off from the Neanderthals, um, the average human being everywhere in the world, their life was um, nasty, brutal, and short. You know, that you lived your life of, of backbreaking poverty punctuated um, by some bowel stewing disease and an early death. And that only changed once in all of human history, and it changed because of liberal democratic capitalism. And the idea that we shouldn't be grateful for that and therefore make the arguments and the effort to sustain it is insane to me. I and mean, that's the suicidal choice that, you know, is in the title of the book. Mm, well, yeah. Are we going to do a subscriber portion? Yeah, we should, get, we should get okay. into that. We got do, do a quick subscriber portion with you. We got our 10 questions we like to ask. We get into the juicier stuff because this part won't be on YouTube. So you can uh, really just go yeah. off. Tell us what you really think about Trump. Here yeah. we go. <laughs> All right. Wait, is, it, is this like lightning round? I got to give quick answers or? We well, get, we'll, get, we'll do our 10 questions in a, in a, in a second. Yeah. In a second. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a couple of other things first here. We got um, any ideas for. Uh, you got any other cool stories? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, uh, but is there anything else you wanted to promote on the uh, to oh, the yeah, that's true. to the freeloaders? Um, Suicide of the West is that the main? Yeah, you know, you Suicide West. You can subscribe. You can check out the Dispatch, where you know I founded with Steve Hayes this new media platform called the Dispatch. Um, you can check out my podcast, The Remnant, which you know I I had this bear guy on, um, and uh, um, or you can. Um, you know, just send me cash, which, you know, you cut out the middleman for all of this stuff. I won't, <laughs> I won't publicize your name. Um, and the more cash, the better. I mean, I just, I mean, I just want about it. We'll put your address on the screen. Appreciate it. Thank you. The rest of this podcast is in our super exclusive premium subscriber lounge. If you're not a Babylon B subscriber, go to babylonb.com slash plans for full length ad free podcasts, access to our headline forum, 20% off the items in the Babylon B store, a gift and more. Please drop us a review on iTunes and share the podcast with a friend. Feedback and love mail go to podcast at babylonb.com. Follow Ethan at AxCop and Kyle at the underscore Kyle underscore man on Twitter.
Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee, reminding you to go forth and punch Satan repeatedly in the ribs. <laughs> <laughs>